Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Ask the Doctor. This is where we have fun every Tuesday night, learn lots of good stuff, and uh, have some fun along the way. So tonight, we are going to learn to change your thoughts and change your life. The man of the hour teaches, trains, and lectures doctors all over the world. He's put in many years and well over 10,000 hours doing this fantastic job. He's an incredibly um, well-known uh, family man, incredible mentor and friend, the incredible Dr. Bob Rakowski. Well, Carol, thank you always for the beautiful intro. You know, up to the last minute, I, I changed the title. I do this call a couple of times earlier in the week for Europe, Africa, and Asia. Uh, and my team out there, especially Pete Cohn, who's a phenomenal author and life coach, uh, he created the title, How to Think Greater Than You Are. And, and to me, that just seemed confusing. So I'm, I'm going with change your thoughts and change your life. Now, I like to tell people that, you know, we used to say a picture is worth a thousand words, but we now know that a picture is worth about two million words. So some fun pictures. I tell people I'm a family man, married for 34 years, three beautiful children, three amazing granddaughters. Uh, and I've treated the full spectrum of patients from world champion professional athletes from every major sport to the critically ill, people sent home to die. Unfortunately, some of those are alive decades later. And as you mentioned, I've taught over 10,000 hours of seminars to doctors. So most topics in natural medicine, functional medicine, I've covered in detail. But there's one that I really, really like, and that's the brain and that's thoughts and especially how we create our life. Uh, and you can go back thousands of years where many sages of wisdom have said that it's really our thoughts that are going to create our life. And this quote I always thought was funny, uh, Yogi Berra said, baseball is 90% mental, the other half is physical. He definitely wasn't a, a math major, but if you talk to high level athletes, they're gonna tell you that high level athletics are 90% athletic regardless of the sport, or sorry, 90% mental. Uh, and life I believe is exactly the same. I've invested in a lot of brain courses, brain research, brain this, brain that. And I think one of the best is uh, Proctor Gallagher Institute's thinking into results. Now, Bob Proctor passed about a month ago, an absolute icon in personal development and help pe people get what they want. You know, and for 60 years, he would tell people, tell me what you want and I'll show you how to get it. And he did that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna summarize a lot of what they shared into that thinking into results. When I talk about life and, and the Magnificent Seven, I've said you've got to eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right every single day. Uh, and think right certainly is going to be a big part of what we want to do. We think with our brain, but keep in mind, it's said that our mind is really a lot more than our brain. Our brain is just the focusing mechanism. Uh, and then plenty of neuroscientists will tell you that we have three brains. So we have a reptilian brain. That's basically what runs our instincts. We have our middle brain, some call it the monkey brain or the emotional brain. Uh, and then we have the human brain, the neo neocortex. And that's really what separates us from all animals. And I've told people now for multiple decades, the data is very clear that the brain is the most nutrient dependent, energy dependent, stress vulnerable and toxin vulnerable system. And we look at our world out there, nutrients are not very good. Stress might be at an all time high. Toxins might be at an all time high. And plenty of people don't have anywhere near enough energy. But there's your PubMeds to, to verify that. And I often talk about a simple strategy that can help people tremendously, regardless of what they're going for. And that's Ganoderma lucidum, the top superfood on the planet. It's phenomenal for the brain. Uh, whether you want to think better, have a more relaxed brain, a nourished brain, an energized brain, or a brain that rests and recovers better, it's all there. Daniel Amen, a best-selling author, psychiatrist, great TED Talk. You know, he said for years, psychiatrists were the only professionals, medical professionals that didn't examine the organ that they were looking at. But he's done uh, probably at this point, well over 100,000 brain scans. But he wrote the book, The End of Mental Illness. And he said, what if mental health and brain health were one and the same? Uh, and they're certainly clearly wrote, uh, related. And one of the things that he learned is that you can actually change people's brains. And keep in mind, it's really said that when you change your mind, you change your mind. When you adopt a new pattern of thinking, you do change that brain. 
Uh, I'm going to go through a lot of quotes through here that I like as it relates to thinking in the brain. But Einstein said this, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And Bob Proctor later said, you know what? It's our subconscious thinking or what he calls the paradigm that really creates the biggest problem. And we'll talk about how to change that as well. Bob Proctor also liked to quote Buckminster Fuller. You can never change things by fighting against the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete, but we could throw in that word paradigm each time there. You can't fight your existing paradigm, your subconscious. You just have to overwrite it. You have to build a new one where you really wouldn't even recognize the person you were, what you used to think, really. And, and those feelings drive your actions, your emotions, and really everything in your entire environment. Jim Rohn is, is a guy that really led the way for so many. He's the guy that launched Tony Robbins. He would talk about the importance of setting goals. And keep in mind, Bob Proctor said, you know, I think most people have goals. They just don't know how to achieve them. And it was all about that mental process, rewriting that paradigm that, that he made a really good case in 60 years of success uh, track record to show that that's the case. But Jim Rohn said, you want to set a goal that's big enough that in the process of achieving it, you become someone worth becoming. And think about that. Whatever you achieve in the goal, well, that's going to come and go. But what you become, uh, hopefully that's forever and forever growing. And we want to do that. We want to get better, stronger, faster, smarter with each passing day, week, or month. Zig Ziglar, I always love what he had to say. You have to be before you can do and do before you have. So ultimately, who are you? And when you become who you want to become, that's when you can create what you want to do. And Zig was a, a great story. You know, he really struggled for a long period of time as a salesman, as a speaker, someone who enjoyed speaking. But ultimately, when he became the type of person he wanted to be, he shared his message in a way that people could get it. So I like this idea of being that's really below the surface. Who are you? Well, people will actually see your behaviors and your results. Uh, and you know the results really can't hide. You can show those all around behaviors. You might be put on your best face somewhere, but wouldn't you wanna be that all the time? But your values, your attitudes, your beliefs, your preferences, your mindset, those are things you can't see. And I love this progression. You decide who you want to be. That's your identity. Uh, and then based on that identity, you take the actions that are consistent with those actions. And then ultimately you create the feelings. So that's a picture of a very young Muhammad Ali when his name was Cassius Clay. And it said that, you know, some of the most powerful words that we'll ever speak are the I am uh, and whatever follows it. And remember Ali, he said, I am the greatest even before he knew that he was. And Sports Illustrated said he was. He was simply the greatest athlete of the entire last century. So while we're on thoughts and on paradigm and on Bob Proctor, the book Think and Grow Rich was something that he read for 60 years. And he said, by the way, he was still learning from it in his 60th year. Uh, and here's really the summary of the book, rich people think differently. Let's take that a little deeper. They purposely create the subconscious mindset of success. And once they master this rich mindset, well, that will lead to riches. So, you know, there was lots of different ways in that book that were discussed, but Andrew Carnegie created that project for Napoleon Hill. And basically he told Napoleon Hill, you know what, you're going to outdo me. Now, Napoleon Hill was a reporter. He was talented for writing, but he didn't have any riches. And Andrew Carnegie was the richest guy in the world at that point in time. Uh, and, you know, he looked at Andrew Carnegie. He said, look, you know, there's no way that's ever going to happen. He says, no, it won't until you get it straight in your subconscious mind. So he gave him an affirmation every single day. And interestingly enough, I think it was estimated that Andrew Carnegie created something like 50 millionaires, maybe 100 but Napoleon Hill, tens of thousands of millionaires with that book, Think and Grow Rich. The Bhagavad Gita, uh, you know, uh, another great spiritual text. I like this quote, for him who has conquered the mind, 
the mind is the best of friends, but for one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest of enemies. So very interesting book. I think it's called Switch. And it says, you know what? You can consider your mind like an elephant. Uh, and that's the subconscious mind, the most powerful part of the mind. Uh, and basically maybe up to 95% of the mind, but the rider on that elephant, well, that's conscious. And, and what this book would basically say is, you know, you can consciously try to direct the elephant and you can even give it a fairly easy path. But if that elephant has its mind made up, you know, that it wants something, good luck trying to control it. Uh, and I think that's a pretty accurate description of how powerful our subconscious mind is. And so therefore, we want to learn how to control that subconscious mind. So from the book, it says successful changes in behavior, three things in common. The person has to be very, very clear about what they want. They have a, they have a deep and powerful emotional commitment to the change. And then ultimately, they can create an environment that makes the change easier. Now, that would include the path, that would include your surroundings, that would especially include the people that you are with. Bruce Lipton, when he talked about programming the subconscious mind, he said there was basically three ways to do it. And since I think in pictures, and I think most of us do, you know, there's inspiration, there's desperation, or there's just real hard work. So inspiration, something you want, probably no more powerful force in the universe than love. Desperation, Jim Rohn would tell his own story. You know, he was a college dropout and two very nice little Girl Scouts knocked on his door selling cookies. He said they were cute, they had a good product, they had a good sales pitch, they were really excited. But he was too embarrassed to tell them that he didn't have a dollar or two dollars, whatever it was. So he looked at him, he said, well, sorry, girls, I already bought cookies from my niece. And they said, well, thank you so much. Thank you for supporting the Girl Scouts. Uh, and when he walked away, he thought, well, how low can I sink? Enough is enough. I'm done with this. Something has to change. And by the way, at Jim Rohn's death, you know, I, I, I Googled his net worth, estimated $500 million. Not a bad turnaround for a broke college dropout in the 1960s. And then the work hard model, Michael Phelps, probably as good as it gets in terms of very powerful consistency. Uh, and that certainly served him well. <clears throat> Bob Proctor, big fan of affirmations. You know, he had a, a series on, on uh, YouTube entitled How to Make a Millions Look Small. He said, why not use this at, uh, affirmation? I'm so happy and grateful now that I am. And by the way, he said, when you look at the Bible, it says, you know, pray uh, as if you already have it. That's in, in the book of Mark. Uh, and, and so even though sometimes it might be hard to say that, I'm so happy and grateful now that I am, and Bob wrote in, I'm earning a million dollars a year. That truth is clearly imagined in my conscious mind. It is effectively planted through constant space repetition in, into my subconscious emotional mind. Therefore, it is presently working into physical form. And he would read that multiple times a day. Uh, and he really liked this from Thomas Troward, which I think is really, really powerful. Uh, and I have another slide that I like a little better, but here's what Troward wrote. My mind is the center of divine operation. And by the way, he's got a phenomenal book where he says that absolutely is it. If you look at the difference between spirit and matter, the difference is really thought. Uh, and therefore, it's really spirit that animates us and spirit that gives us the ability to think. You could call it God if you want, or you could call it divine. So my mind is the center of, of divine operation. The divine operation is always for expansion and fuller expression. And this means the production of something beyond what has gone before, something entirely new, not included in past experience, though proceeding out of it by an orderly sequence of growth. Therefore, since the divine cannot change its inherent nature, it must operate in the same manner in me. Consequently, in my special world of which I am the center, it will move forward to produce new conditions, always in advance of any that have gone before. So I really think that's a powerful affirmation. Uh, and Bob, you know, he made a big impact on me. So again, I'm going to honor him with his teachings. 
So he would ask this question, what are you attracting into your life right now? Look at your results and look at the answers. So how are you mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, financially, and impactfully? And if you want to attract better, we're going to talk about how to do it uh, here and now. And there's that Thomas Troward quote that I, I like it written that form better, but don't need to read it again. Troward, uh, Bob Proctor said, was one of the best teachers of the last 500 years. So I finally went through some of his works. So I've got to tell you, they're really deep. They're really powerful and they're really logical. So I like them as well. But here's what Troward said. He said, the subjective mind, meaning the subconscious mind, is entirely under the control of the objective mind or the conscious mind. With the utmost fidelity, it reproduces and works out, of, out to its final consequences, whatever the objective mind impresses upon it. So we can use our conscious mind to program our subconscious. And Bob was very famous for the stick figure. Uh, he didn't create it, but he absolutely fell in love with it. He says, you know, ask someone to describe their car, they can do it. Ask them to describe the refrigerator, they can do it. Ask them to describe their mind, they really can't. And so he says, this was a picture he was introduced to. He said, your conscious mind is really your thinking mind. Your subconscious mind is your believing mind. And believe it or not, what you believe is what you're going to bring into your world. And then ultimately, that drives your emotions, your actions, and ultimately, your results. Carl Jung, something very famous as well, he says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So why not figure out how to make that subconscious or unconscious conscious? So Bob talked about the highest faculties of our brain. He says, do we all have the same gifts? Uh, I use the memory aid because I like memory aids. That's how I memorize more effectively. What's in it for me? That's everybody's radio station. And then Proctor to honor Bob Proctor. But this is the will, imagination, intuition. Uh, I added focus because I, I like that uh, as a separate call out than will. Memory, perception, uh, and um, great. Now I have to think what the R is. Reason, uh, the ability to accept or reject anything. So the will is basically perseverance. And Babe Ruth said, you can't beat the person who'll never give up. And I like the example of Muhammad Ali. You know, he made up his mind how he's going to beat George Foreman. He was going to let him punch on him until he got tired. And he did that for, I don't know, six or seven rounds or something like that. And then he came off the ropes and he actually knocked him out. Now, if you ever watched that movie or followed the documentary, apparently Ali had sustained so many internal injuries, he was peeing blood for, for weeks on end. So he had actually suffered some pretty significant uh, kidney damage. When we move on to intuition, <clears throat> I like to think of this as our spiritual perception. Spirit is everywhere at all times and is all powerful and is all knowing. Uh, and therefore, if you can connect with that, well, guess what? You have all of that knowledge available to you. And sometimes those strokes of intuition are some of the most powerful things that ever happen in our entire life. Back to Einstein, he said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is the faithful servant. That would be the conscious mind. Uh, we, we have created this society, the honors, the servant is forgotten the gift. So we want to know that intuition is a gift. When we start talking about both logic and imagination, Einstein said this, logic or reason will get you from A to B, but imagination will take you absolutely everywhere. And we should use it as a preview of our coming attractions, the things that we want, certainly not the things that we don't want. Now we move into focus. And I really love the law of focus. What you focus on grows. And I want you to think about that. You know, if you're ever really focused on something, you probably noticed it growing around you. That has certainly been my experience. And the TED Talk, I'll borrow this from Peter Sage. He says, well, what happens out in the world? How about everything? But he uses the metaphor of the Amazon rainforest. He says, what happens in the rainforest everything, every single day? Everything happens in the rainforest. So somewhere there's a snake eating a rat. You could choose to focus on that. Somewhere else, there's a hummingbird being born. You could choose to focus on that. And I would suggest that we'd be better off focusing on what we want to know and doing our best to minimize the things that we don't want to know. 
Joel Olstein used this metaphor. He says, look, you have your windshield and then you have your rear view mirror. And by the way, the rear view mirror has value, but really you need to pay attention to what's in front of you. What's behind us is really for learning. Uh, technical definition of memory, it's mental activity, the brain's ability to, re to reproduce past experiences and thoughts. That is what memory is. And I like this definition. Memory is the sum total of what we remember and gives us the capability to learn and adapt from previous experiences, as well as build relationships. Now, one of my mentors asked the question, can you change the past? Can you change your past memories? And he went on to say that he believes you can, because guess, guess what? Many, many times something that happened to us that when it happened, we thought was absolutely horrible, but yet paved the way for something much, much better. Well, can we create that? Can we learn from things and ultimately say, okay, whatever that was, was supposed to instruct me in a way that ultimately makes things better for me. And another quote that I like, good times become memories, bad times become lessons. Perception, I love this quote from Wayne Dyer. You know, I don't know how many books I read from him. He, he wrote a bunch, probably 20 or something like that. But he said, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that's perception. Uh, and Bob Proctor, you know, gave a practical example. He says, if you're having a problem, write it down on a piece of paper and stare at it and think of different ways you can solve it. He says, then pretend you're me. He says, how would Bob Proctor look at this? Uh, or pick anyone that you think is capable of solving it and say, well, how would they look at it? And then ultimately, maybe you can change your perception and even change the problem to an opportunity. Uh, and the experience uh, experiment called the Pygmalion effect showed that you, if you actually thought of people as better than they are, they can actually live up to those expectations. So why not speak greatness into everybody all the time? Another Einstein quote, the most important decision we can make is whether we believe in a friendly or hostile universe. That's our perception. That's our perspective. We want to change the way that we ultimately look at and then finally, reason, a technical definition, the capacity of consciously making sense of things, applying logic or adapting or justifying practices, institutions, and beliefs based on existing information. Bob Proctor liked to say it's our reason that tells us whether we can accept or reject ideas that come in uh, and certainly accept or reject planting them into our subconscious. And he also loved this quote from Voltaire. He says, we live in a universe of natural laws and there is no such thing as an accident. What we call by that name is the effect of some cause that we don't see, but there's always a cause. And some would say we're always the cause of everything in our own world. So that was kind of academic and maybe hopefully a little practical there, but that leads to our questions and answers. Uh, and I'll stop that share and let's see if anybody has any questions about anything at all. Well, you left them all dumbfounded. There are no questions in the chat yet, but give us a second. I'm sure Claudio's ready and good to go. I am, I am, I am good to go, yes. <laughs> uh, three separate items. Yeah, you know what? I just, uh, all the quotes are just, like I said, I've got to rewatch this screen shoot and take more notes for sure, 100%. I've got a, a work colleague actually on the phone here. She's dealing with a few items, uh, fibromyalgia, uh, blood, high blood pressure and um, cholesterol. If you can just give us a breakdown individually in all three, I'm sure my friend will appreciate it. Well, <clears throat> as a general rule, those are all considered functional challenges created by not making the best choices for that person's genetics, physiology, health goals, et cetera. So, you know, if you go to pubmed.gov and were to look up Ganoderma and fibromyalgia, I could pull up the reference. It was a six week study. It was exclusively women because women tend to suffer fibromyalgia more than men. But basically giving Ganoderma consistently over the course of six weeks, improved function, decreased pain, improved range of motion, improved quality of life. Uh, and there's other things that we can add on to that. It's also good for blood pressure by multiple mechanisms, uh, including being an, an angiotensin and current converting enzyme inhibitor, a nitrate donor, 
Uh, and uh, as something that modulates insulin, it actually reduces sodium reabsorption from the distal tubules of the kidneys by modulating the inflammatory process. It enhances nitric oxide as well. So now we've covered the uh, fibromyalgia. And, and Claudia, I didn't, I didn't make notes. So tell me again, the, the other uh, thing. Cholesterol, please. Yeah, so cholesterol, there's a lot of misinformation on cholesterol and British Medical Journal published a study uh, in 2020, where they actually looked at elevated LDL cholesterol. That's the one where medicine says, you know what, you want your highs high. I agree with that. We want our HDL high. We want our LDL low. But they actually found out for 92% of people over the age of 60, a higher LDL uh, was a, a predictor of greater longevity. Uh, and so cholesterol functions as an antioxidant, it has some low level of anti-inflammatory action, the body makes the vast majority of cholesterol. But looking at cholesterol, the most important ratio is HDL, the high cholesterol, uh, and that ratio to triglycerides. And there was a huge study out of Stanford where they found the worst of the worst cases when HDL exceeded triglycerides, people actually reverse cardiovascular disease. So, Ganoderma can help with that, but this person would probably benefit from a comprehensive program. But I'll tell you, you know, every once in a while, my world gets really rocked by some things that seem off the wall, but work pretty well. And there's a medical doctor named Sean Baker who wrote the book called The Carnivore Diet. And I was on a private Zoom with him and got to ask him questions. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. Harvard is actually studying this now. Uh, and there seems to be some benefits. Well, Joe Rogan did it. He's the most popular podcaster. He lost something like 21, 20 pounds in a month and started feeling like a million bucks. Then he had Jordan Peterson on as a guest. Jordan Peterson's a great thinker. He's from Canada, Toronto, clinical psychologist, best-selling author, wrote the book, Dr. Uh, jo uh, sorry, 12 Rules for Life. But Jordan Peterson had a daughter that had severe rheumatoid arthritis so bad that she had many major joints replaced by age 20. Hips, knees, ankles, shoulders, elbows, wrists, a life of pain for such a young lady. Well, once she started the car carnivore diet, within a fairly short period of time, all of her pain went away. So Jordan Peterson said, well, what the heck, let me try it. Well, he's now been eating carnivore for four years. He lost 60 pounds. He was clinically depressed and anxious. That's not going on. He said his mind and body are sharper than ever. He had all kinds of aches and pains. So I thought, well, what the heck? I'll try it. Well, you know, I didn't need to lose weight. I pay very good attention to my chemistry. But I'll tell you, the three days that I did carnivore, I got so lean so fast. It was absolutely unbelievable. And, and so I had three patients that were really struggling. Now, they were all males. So today was the first day I recommended it for a female. But all three of them, one guy had a blood pressure 190 over 110. In 15 days, he lost more than 15 pounds and dropped it to 135 over 85. Now that's pretty remarkable. You would take multiple drugs to get that done, but he did it just with the carnivore diet. Uh, the other two weren't as dramatic, but were also very, very powerful. So if people are willing to do it, why not give it a shot? So, you know, Maybe go to YouTube, Jordan Peterson, carnivore diet. I still like supplementation. I still think we need our activated our omega-3s. I still like a stress reset, melatonin, theanine, ganoderma spores. Those are super powerful. But uh, you know, right now I'm thinking the carnivore diet might be uh, pretty significant. I think I'm going to try that for myself too. Thank you. And I think the last one was the blood pressure, but I think we've covered that as well, correct? Yeah, Ganoderm is anti-blood pressure, so is carnivore. Okay. Thank Joyce you, sir. asks. So, um, I, by the way, Carlos uh, Reigns, who's a medical doctor, said a study showed supplementation with alpha-linoleic acid. Oh, no, you said alpha-lipoic acid. Sorry, I went to LA, and, and I'm glad you wrote it. Alpha-lipoic acid significantly decreased concentration of uh, triglycerides, total cholesterol, LDL, uh, but didn't lower HDL or didn't affect it. So HDL, we want to stay high. Alpha lipoic acid is something that enhances insulin signaling uh, and is certainly one of my protocols for insulin resistance and diabetes. So there, there's going to be uh, some benefits there. 
It's also the bridge, uh, lipoic acid is the bridge between anaerobic energy production and aerobic energy production. So, you know, that would mean that we'd probably burn more fat and that would probably be one of the mechanisms where it'd be both insulin friendly and good for body composition as well. So thank you for that, Dr. Rains. Okay, Joyce asks, when ingesting Ganoderma tea coffee, does the body convert to alkaline and does, does the hot water not destroy the medical properties? Well, that's the beauty of it. So it was traditionally used in, in tea. The heat does not destroy it. You know, there are certainly things known as heat labile nutrients. There are certain things you heat up beyond a certain point and you destroy them, but that doesn't appear to be the case with the uh, components of Ganoderma. And there are literally thousands of published studies to show that uh, in PubMed alone and 5,000 plus years of human clinical year use. So when you start looking at the coffee and tea, we have a patented process by which we alkalize the coffee. The water makes a difference as well. But one of the explanations that I really like about this is let's say even if you had not the best water and if you were to stick a dipstick in it right away, it might even be a little bit on the acid side. Ganoderma considered the most alkaline food on the planet. By the time it passes through the body, it's going to have alkalizing properties. So think about it. If you were to actually do lemon water, lemon water is a weak acid, you know, and, and not that weak. It's probably around 5.0. But once you drink it and it goes through the system, it has alkalizing benefits. And so it's the total nutritive picture that makes the difference. Perfect. With the products, what would you recommend for someone having difficulty and wanting to get off anxiety slash depression pills? Well, I'm going I'm to go back to Jordan Peterson. He said carnivore made a big difference. But with our products, when we looked at Ganoderma, the spores are the most powerful. The mycelium is considered to be the most effective for the brain. Ganoderma is known to enhance serotonin for happiness, dopamine for extreme happiness, GABA for calmness, and acetylcholine for memory. So really any of the products could work, but my go-to is the spores. Uh, and keep in mind that there's a quote from the medical literature that says there's universal agreement. So it's not just this passing thought. There's universal agreement that 50 to 75% of all depression is stress-induced. Therefore, if we give people a stress reset, you know, and get them in a nurturing, loving environment and get them to surround with people that are supporting them in a loving way, that's one of the best ways to get there. And you know, I'm fully certain that not all of us have the same balance of brain chemistry. And I would tell people when I teach brain chemistry, if you know, if we had 100 people in the room, we'd line everybody up according to whoever had the most feel-good neurotransmitters on one side of the room and whoever had the least feel-good neurotransmitters on the other side of the room. And most of us are gonna be in the middle. Well, those that have the most, we might even call those manic. So there might be a small percentage that might need medicine for a period of time to calm them down. Then the other end, we find people that are depressed and they might need a little bit of medication to pick them up, but most of us, we're gonna be in that sweet spot. And so if we learn to take good care of our body and brain and direct our thoughts and nourish our body, mind and spirit, uh, you know, we, we can build a great life. So it'd be spores that I'd recommend, but really a complete program uh, an environment tends to trump will. And, and so you want to get in a nurturing, loving environment and be very selective about what you expose yourself to. You know, I had a conversation with a gentleman today that he's got severe insomnia. Well, in the evening, he likes to catch up on what's going on in the world. Well, holy cow, you know, uh, you know, take that flashlight in that Amazon forest and focus on the hummingbird being born. Because, you know, what they want to show us and what's real, as much good has been in the world has always been there, maybe more. And they just seem to be highlighting that which isn't good. Uh, but let's just magnify the good and share the good. Perfect. Ralph asked, what constitutes a true carnivore diet? Well, the most extreme, uh, Jordan Peterson says it's red meat, salt, and water. That's all you get now, different cuts of red meat. But there's plenty of people that have said, you know, you can, you can do meat, fish, egg, dairy, as long as you don't have a sensitivity to it, uh, even cheese, you know? So just make sure that the, the product agrees with you. But for the most extreme, and Jordan Peterson said this on Joe Rogan, he says, I never cheat. He says, I just don't. I 
do my my diet. And, you know, four years later, I feel so much better. I'm never going to change. And how about his daughter from being crippled to creating a much better life just by changing what she ate? It's pretty powerful. Okay. Can autonomic nervous system issues be caused by structural issues, i.e. spinal instability? And do you have any protocol solution, uh, sorry, protocols, nutritional recommendations for ANS issues? Well, so certainly everything works together, you know, and the whole theory of chiropractic, which by the way, I am a chiropractor, is, is that imbalances in the structure of the spine can have a negative impact on the nervous system and there can be effects on whatever's at the end of the nerves that are affected. And sometimes those are organs and sometimes those are muscles. And so, you know, we do see if we balance someone's structure, sometimes their digestion gets better. Sometimes they breathe a little easier uh, and things like that. But the big things that get us stress, toxins, malnutrition, physical inactivity, or if we go to the Magnificent Seven, we've got to eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right every single day. And in order to make recommendations, my first question is, what's causing the problem? And, you know, we always want people to make better choices. And when we find deficits, we try to get them past them as quick as possible. But I would start thinking of, you know, a really good whole body structural balancing. You know, and, and you know, I think there's some really good yoga protocols that can help that. I'm, I'm amazed that, you know, yoga stood the test of time because it, it helps people move better and get more balance. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to nutrition, I like my whole pyramid, food, superfood, functional food, multivitamin, probiotics, activated omega-3s, uh, and a combination of D3, K2. But stress reset uh, and probably yoga would be the first thing I'd think about there. Excellent. Does anybody have any other questions they would like to throw in? Joyce has a question. Do you want to unmute Joyce? Go for it, Joyce. There, sorry. <laughs> uh, I did send it in to you. I don't know whether you've seen it or not, but I will I will say I had given my son uh, the all the coffee mixture. You had a whole a box of different ones and uh, the spores. And so he started taking the coffee uh, and he only took it for three days before he started getting the tingling on the bottom of his feet. And then, then next thing you know, it was uh, pins and needles. Um, within five days, he had to quit. He couldn't go to work. He had to come back from work. Uh, is, did you know anything that would cause that? And as soon as he stopped taking the coffee, didn't take the spores. And as soon as he stopped taking the coffee, about three days later, it all went away. Well, I would call that a detox reaction. So remember, no known toxicity, no known drug interaction. And if there was something you were trying to do first, there's you know dozens, if not hundreds of studies of Ganoderma clearing some really severe stuff from the body, heavy metals, uh, MPTP, which would actually cause Parkinson's in the animal model, it protected against that. Uh, and when we see people that have something like that, well, we have a couple options. They can either power through it and get it out of their body, or they can slow it down to the point where they can handle it. But you know, you, you, you don't enhance the immune system, detoxify, nourish the body, alkalize the body, modulate the inflammatory process, kill off infection, and generally cause challenges. You move people to a better state of health, but if his body was maybe killing some organism that was creating what they call a Herxheimer reaction, you know, anything's fair game in terms of a detox reaction. So the right thing was to do was to back it off, but you know, to realize that there's, there's something that his body needs to deal with. And, and uh, just a little slower might be the way to go for him. Well, then just one cup of coffee each day well, then until you... You know, over time you get better. So when I put people on a really intense detox, most of the people I know want to be better yesterday. Uh, and as long as they know, and we mark a number, you know, it's not like we blindly tell people, well, do this and that's that. We do plenty of measurements. When I see people as a patient, if they're having a response like this, we'll bring in and we'll, we'll do it before and after and we'll compare and we'll go, look at this, look how much better that is. Look how much better that is. Look how the fluid shift has happened. Your body's clearly detoxing. So the question is, do you want to get over this as quick as possible or do you want to take a break and be more comfortable? Uh, and people always have to pick what's right for them. But it wouldn't yeah, be so, to do, sorry, it wouldn't be any to do with circulation, would it? 
Well, every Penguin. piece of literature says it's it improves circulation. Okay. So, okay. Well, thank you very much. Guys. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Uh, Bob. Yes. Happy, beautiful evening. I asked you this last night. I asked it wrong. So I would like to ask it better tonight. Low potassium, high blood pressure. I come up with, with a name that I don't Hyper find. Hyperaldosteronism. Right. Yeah. So, so that is low potassium, high blood pressure. Well, that's what we would call pathogenomic of that. Aldosterone is a hormone that's made by the adrenal glands. And it basically causes the kidneys to reabsorb sodium and fluid and kick out potassium. Uh, now, too much sodium, too much fluid, too much blood pressure, too little potassium, that can be problematic, especially for the heart. And, and so the question has to be, what's causing the hyperaldosteronism? Sometimes it's a tumor, and we want to make sure that's not the case. Uh, but either way, you know, under good medical guidance, some level of potassium should be given, and I would recommend a stress reset, which is the melatonin every waking hour, theanine every waking hour, Ganoderma spores every waking hour. Uh, you know, I've seen plenty of people lower their blood pressure with this. I've seen plenty of people improve their sodium potassium balance with this. Uh, but, you know, this case might be, it might need some medical consult just to make sure it's, it's this person's not at risk of, of having a real serious crisis. Right. So they've been, been doing the medical consult the last week. They've been in the, the a, a hospital. Uh, doing all the tests, it seems like there is no tumor. That's good news. So, so then it's the stress reset is how we help the, her the most. That's that's how we do it functionally. I'd be curious to see what their medical model is. You know, I'm I'm pretty sure they're going to be giving them potassium because you need potassium. Yeah. But that's something you got to be slow and steady with. But you know, if I know the medical model and maybe maybe uh, Dr. Rains can say what they do for that. I mean, heck, they might give them anti-anxiety meds and you know anti-inflammatories and you know God knows what. They might even give them a real strong corticosteroid to take some of the you know put the brakes on the adrenal glands. That might happen. Uh, now we do it with melatonin. That puts the brakes directly on the adrenals with the with the pituitary drive. Actually uh, protects the body from what's known as adrenal corticotrophin hormone. The theanine is a natural GABA facilitator. Uh, Ganoderma drives the parasympathetic nervous system, so that's going to calm the body. It's a, it's a GABA facilitator, so that calms the mind. And the literature even calls it the herb of spiritual potency, so there could be some benefit there. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you for looking out for your friend. And I think right. you asked it just fine yesterday, Jeff. I, maybe I just didn't answer in a way that you could hear it. No, it's just that when, when I asked them that about the tumor and stuff it just seems so so outfield that i got that i lost that i thought oh i must have asked it wrong to start with i looked it up too but i guess we're good good we're good now for sure i know thank you you're welcome excellent any other questions my friends I'm overloaded and overstimulated, but thank you. I love to learn. Wow. I love all of you. Thank you for your commitment to health and pay it forward in a beautiful way. By the way, last week uh, I, got a, I got banned from YouTube for a week because they said I was sharing misinformation, even though there were published medical studies. Uh, so there you go. But uh, so this week, hopefully I can post this one. So. I, I don't think you did anything wrong this time. I don't think I did anything wrong anytime, but <laughs> that's, that's, I don't make that decision. So good night all and God bless. Good night. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Mom.